Well, uh, thank you, Rick. Um, the, uh, the topic uh, comes from my interest in um, language and understanding of healthcare through languages. And uh, the original idea behind VISTA was to create a meta dictionary, metadata dictionary to map uh, the database through uh, a higher level of understanding of what the data dictionary saw. So rather than writing a program to do X, uh, we wrote a program to do Y, which then named X or Y or Z or, or anything else. So there was an, a level of indirection. And uh, it worked really well. And it's 34 years old now. And looking at the next 34 years, the question is, uh, where do you go from here? And what, what causes the, um, uh, us to pull ourselves into this higher level of abstraction that we had with uh, FileMan and the Data Dictionary? So part of that is the um, Christopher Alexander's work with pattern languages. And he was an architect that started looking at kind of the philosophy of spaces and what made uh, a space have vitality. He called it the quality without a name. Uh, why is a cathedral different than a warehouse? Uh, the warehouse is more efficient for any given set of volume, but for some reason people build these beautiful structures that have characteristics and vitality that's much richer than just the bare bones uh, uh, transactional value of building the space. And uh, so he called it a pattern language and he broke up his architecture into these patterns uh, which were uh, a kind of a structured form for looking at how uh, architects, well, uh, how he saw s space. So one of his patterns, for example, was a cozy nook that is a, uh, an area that's off the side of, say, a kitchen, and uh, it it's a, pooches out into the garden or whatever. So it's part of the kitchen, but it also kind of extends into the a neighboring area. And you just feel cozy and vital for wanting to, to come into that space. And he doesn't say that the cozy nook has to be 14% of the size of the kitchen or a certain height. Or he doesn't give the, the specifications. He gives the general qualities, and he calls it generativity. And a pattern, then, is this generative approach. And so you can take the cozy nook of a kitchen and talk about the cozy uh, bench in a park. And if you just put a, uh, a bench in a, uh, a lawn, in the park, it doesn't feel cozy, it's, it's isolated. But if you put uh, bushes around it and maybe a pergola over it, it becomes inviting and cozy. So the sense of coziness now becomes part of this language for talking about space. So the object-oriented uh, computer people have taken up pattern languages, and uh, there's quite a thriving uh, pattern technology uh, that's, that's uh, kind of taken the world by storm over the last 10, 15 years. And uh, so there's a lot of design patterns for talking about software. So my interest is in what could we do with using pattern languages for talking about healthcare? And not just the programs in healthcare, but the overall vitality that we feel when we're healthy. Um, and talk about you know, the vitality of a healthcare system in the same way as you talk about the vitality of a, of a cathedral or a beautiful design. And I think it's important to know that architects today build beautiful things. The skyscrapers, the uh, parks, the communities, there is an element of beauty into it. It's not just the most efficient uh, possible way to uh, build the space. So we do build uh, winding paths instead of square paths. We, we build uh, buildings with uh, uh, interesting roofs and roof lines with big atriums and this welcoming sense to the, f the building. And Steve Jobs noticed that. Uh, he, he knows beauty, and the, the iPhone is a beautiful device. This is not the cheapest possible gadget that does the simplest thing. Well, it's simple, but it, it is a sense of beauty that he's built into his products. So we have an example in technology of the value of beauty, and people do pay for the, the feel of, of, a, of an iPad, the I, I, iPhone. And it is a sensual experience when you take it out of the box. So there is this out-of-box experience that the de designer is very carefully uh, yeah. designed. And it is a, a memorable experience to get your first uh, gadget from it. So, so there is beauty in our design world that is paid for. It's funded. It's a worthwhile thing for us to, to strive for a beautiful uh, system of some sort. So the question I'm asking, can we create a beautiful health system? 
Can we use the same sensibility and the same values that we're putting into our buildings and our, our telephones to, to build a beautiful healthcare system? And I know that kind of sounds silly when everybody talks about a percentage of the GDP and this and that and all the problems that we're facing with the healthcare system, but maybe building this beautiful system is actually a way of getting us out of the quagmire. Uh, if nothing else, it's a, it's a way of coming up with an alternative uh, vision of things. So I think uh, there's some examples of that already out there. Um, well, there's some counterexamples out there already, by the way, uh, <laughs> pretty much the whole uh, transactional healthcare system today. But um, I think that, uh, well, there's another in very interesting uh, book called, uh, by Bernard Sue, it's called Games, Gods, and Grasshoppers, and it's a, it's about game theory and how games are a way of achieving uh, something that's fun, uh, but it's less, less efficient. So it's the rules for making things less efficient for more fun. And uh, if, if you're playing chess with somebody, uh, you can't win by hitting them over the head with a baseball bat. <laughs> you have to follow the rules and your pawn acts like the pawn. And if you cheat, you're not playing chess anymore. So the, the, it's not the most efficient way to do things to play chess, but the joy of chess playing and the, the challenges is in the rules and the, the formulations. So the creative creation of the rules uh, creates the enjoyment. So I'm sure Alicia here will talk about gaming here also here soon. But uh, so the, the, the notion that we have to build the most efficient system in order to maximize or optimize the single variable that we consider what healthcare is uh, may have to go. It, 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 we might have to move to this transformational view of health and not simply the transactional input-output uh, cost minimization maximization model. So um, the positive psychology is a, a brainstorm of Martin Seligman at University of Pennsylvania and others. Uh, they faced a, uh, a, um, a problems with the DSM-4 uh, Diagnostic Standards Manual for Psychiatry, which is part of the ICD uh, coding system. And he said, all we have is ways of talking about being sick in psychiatry or psychology. We don't have ways of talking about health and vitality and the virtues in life. So he, uh, with another guy, Peterson from Michigan, I think, created a book called Character, Strengths, and Virtues. Mm -hmm. And they started looking at what were the positive uh, characteristics that cultures around the world um, used. So there's a very interesting website called Values in Action, and you can take a a strength survey and what were your character strengths, uh, characteristic strengths. And uh, so it's a standard psychological testing type thing, but it says, well, your, your strengths are creativity and innovation and generosity or whatever, which is an interesting way to look at yourself and understand yourself. And from that, you can talk about uh, problems if they occur. But it's, he's, I think, the first one to come up with a formal structure for looking at the positive and I call that the positive flip. And the question is, could we do it on a broader basis? Could we do a positive flip for all of ICD-9 or 10 or 15? And uh, is there a way of coming up with an understanding of that which is positive and vital and <coughs> gives us the, the, that which is health? So one of our projects that we've started here was to start interviewing people and uh, gathering stories um, and Alicia Adamson here has uh, been doing that for this session, and she's also been doing some research before coming here to talk about uh, what, what are the patterns of specifically VISTA, I think we've been talking about. But um, part of that is, is building up this uh, mechanism for looking at patterns. And um, maybe I should just turn it over to you and let you start talking about what you've discovered on patterns or what you want to say about it. Sure. Well, one of the the ideas of, of architecture that I think applies very well to my conversations with all y'all on VISTA is that back in the day, way back in the day, when we were going to architect something beautiful, we didn't have to sit down and crunch the numbers and draw on graph paper and have special pencils and erasers. We learned how to build something beautiful by watching people build something beautiful. And we learned to build uh, you know, our cave on the hillside uh, by going to work with our parents and carving out a, a hillside cave and, and watching our parents, you know, maybe build a little flower bed and, 
And then when we grew up and it came time for us to build our hillside cave, we remembered uh, the, the aspects of what was cozy and comfortable and aesthetically pleasing about the work we did organically with our community and our family. And as I've been talking to folks about VISTA, and certainly VISTA is an architected system, there was you know, thought and intelligent design that was put into it, but one of the uh, reoccurring themes in talking to the developers and the community users is that VISTA has grown organically uh, over the course of 35 years. Uh, and there's something to be said for the strength of a system that has been hammered on, tested, thousands of hands and eyes on this tool. Uh, I think that's pretty cool. There were a couple of other um, really obvious themes, and, and at first I thought, well, these are obvious. Of course people love to feel personally satisfied about their work. Um, and, I, and I had to pause for a second and say, well, just because it's obvious doesn't mean it's not interesting or worth noting. Uh, so I actually got on Facebook, because that's what I do. And I, I wrote this, and I think this was, um, this will sum it up. The, the themes that I saw, I just said patterns, community interaction, social responsibility, conviction, and knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that your work saves lives and improves the human condition. It's amazing what happens when people work together based on these values. An artifact of these patterns, personal satisfaction, and wait for it, fun. <laughs> I was absolutely delighted uh, and, and not expecting to have everybody sit down and go, working in Vista is so much fun. The community is fun. Uh, now, not to say that it isn't hard and there aren't you know, hair pulling moments, but uh, you know, taking a, a, a gross look at the body of work that you have done over the last, if it's 30 years or three years, um, that always came out. It was very interesting to me. Uh, the other component that uh, I wasn't expecting necessarily is, is how much y'all like each other. <laughs> um, and, and while they're there, and, and oh, just uh, as a footnote, I don't know anything about Vista. I'm not a Vista person, I've never deployed it. I think I've seen it once on someone's computer um, so I didn't come into this thinking certain thoughts uh, about VISTA or, uh, or timid to ask questions that seemed germane to whatever train of thought we were going. So uh, people were very complimentary of how brilliant you are. I don't know, and, I, and then I got to thinking, well, uh, there are a couple of things we have to take into consideration is that we're self-selecting people who are willing to get in front of a camera. So there's a certain type of person that's willing to get in front of a camera. Um, and generally, people don't like to get in front of a camera and say things that aren't very pleasant, <laughs> right? Because that, that, that goes down forever. Um, but it was, it was delightful. It was absolutely delightful to talk with folks and to hear the conviction and passion uh, for VISTA, but then there'd be this, but it's not just VISTA, it's about healthcare. It's about saving, saving people's lives. It's about um, the, the work that we're really trying to do and, and people would invariably come back to the idea that VISTA was created for this specific purpose. This is why this tool was made. Uh, now I, I you know, don't have any spreadsheets or, or anything for this, this anecdote that I'm presenting to you today. I, I suspect at some point I'll have to come up with one because there's going to be a whole group of people who don't think it's valuable unless there's a spreadsheet, um, but that's okay. Um, trying to think, there were some, some other themes that, and I, I wrote them down on my handy little device here, if you'll just bear with me. Or maybe, you know, I'll just pause and, and turn it back over to you folks, and, and do you have any thoughts on just that? Well, I, I think, uh Rick, do you want to say something yourself, or do you sure. want? Sure. Okay. Well, sure. unaccustomed as you are. Uh, unaccustomed as I am. <coughs> Stay seated, though, because <laughs> yes, we're yes, the camera. No, no disturbing the camera. Um, one of the things that comes to mind as we have this discussion about beauty and healthcare is uh, the Diné tradition. Oh yes, right. I'm being immortalized now. Uh, the the Diné tradition, the Navajo peoples. Uh, for anyone who's read the Tony Hillerman Mysteries, uh, they're an excellent introduction to Navajo culture. And Navajo culture uh, is quite different from white culture. 
Uh, they believe in good and evil, but they believe that evil has as much purpose in the world as good does, and that the proper relationship is not that good will become evil so that it can destroy evil and then be triumphant as good, but rather that there's a proper place for everything. There's a balance to be found in life, uh, a harmony, and you have to put yourself into harmony with your circumstances. So in times of peace, men and women alike follow the women's way, the way of beauty, uh, the way of harmony. Uh, when they greet each other, they say, ya at eh, which means it is beautiful. Uh, which you might literally come across in English more colloquially as walk in beauty. Um, and they mean it. Uh, when white people first encountered the Navajo, they thought they had no religion um, because they never, there was no time when they went aside and then said, now we're going to be good. Or now is the time when we, you know, gnash our teeth over how evil we are. Uh, it, there was never this separation of the sacred and the beautiful and the profound. And it took, I think a century before white people figured out that's because to the Navajo, all of life is the church, all of nature is the church, all of the world is the place to be beautiful. Uh, a key example of, the, there's so many examples, I mean, everything about their life is about this, but a key example has to do with the treatment of veterans. Uh, Navajo are um, fiercely patriotic, um, and when uh, a Navajo is going to leave the reservation and go join the military to fight in a war, uh, there is a sacred ceremony that they perform, and it's not like arbitrarily created, but they've been doing it for centuries, maybe, maybe millennia, it's hard to say. Um, and it is the process by which a man steps out of the path of beauty and goes into the path of evil. It's, it's, uh, he's, gonna, he's gonna become an enemy to people, and he's gonna walk out of balance in order to, to deal with evil. And uh, w that ceremony, when it's complete, he goes off, and it's, it's why, um, when, uh, when Navajos are soldiers, they have a very low incidence of uh, uh, brutality against prisoners and enemies because they go into it having prepared themselves for the things they might have to do. They're never shocked and surprised by what's about to happen. Conversely, when uh, Navajo veterans return home to be reincorporated into society, they, they have a very low rate of um, veteran PTSD and instigated violence. And the reason is, if you think about the rest of the parenthesis here, they have another sacred ceremony that they've been doing for thousands of years uh, in which they, they bring the person back out of the man's way of life and back into the woman's way uh, so that they can walk in beauty again. And this usually, although not always, involves uh, marrying them off. Uh, someone from the community says, uh, some woman from the community, whether they know him or not, says, you know, for us to be in harmony, this person has to be brought back into alignment and into beauty, and I'm gonna be the one to do it. And uh, it is remarkable how, how peaceful it makes the people who have done even terrible things during wartime to know they did their job, they reconciled themselves to the things they've done, they've apologized to the enemies that they had to fight, but now it's time to be beautiful again and healthy. That's, uh, yeah. Interesting uh, story, I think the, the Pattern people will talk about uh, resolving forces in designing a, a pattern, and I, I wish I was more eloquent on actually what pa Alexander did. And my friends who are watching this in the future will probably think I'm, you know, mauling his thinking. But uh, it has to do with um, uh, resolving the forces for any given problem. Of uh, if you're building a, uh, a a gully, for example, is a self uh, negating pattern, uh, it's just going to get di deeper and deeper and cut its way out and it's, it's going to hurt itself by being a gully. But a forest can be uh, self-replicating and regenerate itself and stay a forest. Um, so that's one example of this, the, the resolving of the force, forces that a forest is able to stay a forest because it resolved the forces of pests and plants and evolution and all the things that make a forest a forest, but it somehow has found a balance of, of these areas. But it's, it, it's not a matter of efficiency. You can't say the forest is running at 100% optimization <laughs> or something like that. And the very word optimization to me indicates that somebody's applying a, a certain kind of uh, thinking that may not be appropriate for the, uh, the, the topic, particularly if it's a cat-like problem. So, is this cat running at 100% efficiency? <laughs> God, I hope not. <laughs> yeah. Right. And danger, danger, Will Robinson. And, and correctness, uh, you know, is the cat running co correctly? Uh, 
is the web running cor correctly right now or not? Um, you can't even ask that question and make sense of it. But you can talk about these broader levels of abstractions and patterns that, that do make sense, I think. And um, so uh, the, what my exposure to patterns has been is there's a formal process for gathering patterns. Um, the Hillside Group in uh, California has been kind of a leading group on this. And they have a whole pattern language workshop model of people collecting patterns and then presenting them to a workshop. And they have a, a shepherding process where the shepherd, who is a, an experienced pattern uh, writer or guru, uh, helps the novices bring their patterns in. And they have a, a whole ethic for doing this. Um, uh, Hillside.com, I think you'll find the, the website reference to it. But, um, and out of that comes a, a language that um, people can use for discussing that particular domain. So I've introduced Cozy Nook here, and, and we now have a language that we can talk about Cozy in a way that we couldn't have talked about before. And are there other terms that we can talk about in healthcare, or could we do all of healthcare in terms of these patterns of, of vitality and uplift and resilience? What does resilience really mean? And uh, so um, that's the kind of thing that I'd like to strive for. It, obviously, it's, it's uh, not a trivial undertaking. Pattern writing is a lot of work. Uh, the people who write it, uh, you know, they slave over the patterns. One of the rules I know is that you need to have uh, point to three instances of the pattern to make it a pattern. It's just not you thinking that it's a good idea. You have to say, this is a pattern in three different uh, uh, contexts, and from that you start generalizing. And it's a process of abstraction, of, of thinking at one level of higher ab ab abstraction than the meets the eye, shall we say. And it's kind of like inventing zero when you're Roman, ancient Greek, uh, playing with Roman numerals. So it's a, it's a way of reaching up to a higher level of abstraction and then crawling into that language and using that for your next generation of, of thinking. So anyway, I'm excited about it. Um, I, I think we have a, a good starting point here. Uh, we need uh, enthusiastic people that are willing to learn. Are you going to say something here? Um. I was uh, going to your example about the, the good and the evil. And one of the other things that I noticed is, and then I'm, I'm going to use some words that haven't been nailed down as Sure. Uh, some words that uh, came to mind as, as I was listening to folks talk about the enemy and the vendors and <laughs> <laughs> um, you know the people who just don't get it uh, and this general sense of being flummoxed that well but this is Vista and it's been working and and um, one of the the that was just evident. I don't, I don't want to qualify it. And, and so I, I actually wrote uh, in my notes, it's us versus the muggles. You know, this <laughs> idea that they just don't understand us or what we're doing. Um, and, and there's a caution there, but, you know, not for me to espouse. But, and, and the drinking the Kool-Aid, you know, stuff. I think someone gave a talk yesterday about drinking the Kool-Aid. I didn't get to see it, but I got to hear about it. Bob Wentz. Um, I'm sorry? That was Bob Wentz. Bob Wentz. Yeah, and another aspect, going back to this idea of organically designing something that's functional and potentially beautiful, is that uh, the railroad, I, and I don't know the history of the railroad, and I don't know what the metaphor is really supposed to mean, but y'all have actually put a lot of thought into making sure that you keep adding more cars to the train and creating a new generation of people that can help carry the baton. And uh, there is this immense respect for the elders. We call them hard hats. Uh, it's really interesting. Uh, and listening to the hard hats, it's there, there's this need to make sure that we've got folks that are, are going to help pass on this work. Uh, and why, why? You know, I asked a lot of people, why Vista? You know, you're going to dedicate your life's work to this. Why? Um, have, don't have a whole lot to, I'm not going to go down that, that path today, but um, again, there was just a lot of conviction, and that's a beautiful thing all by itself. That there, there's, there are generations of people who have been working on passing on this beautiful thing. 
Uh, and, and one of the, the things that I want to say, and this is for me personally saying to all y'all, is that um, I really want to understand what are those fundamental patterns because I am building things too. And I am bringing in my own set of, of people, my tribe. We're building open source projects. Um, I gave an OHT day talk uh, that Tom uh, uh, gave us the, the pleasure of his company on, on this OHT day talk. And I'm building multi-stakeholder communities, getting vendors together and, and asking them to please work together uh, to build tools that I think are important. And I hope to glean from this project elements or aspects of what led to that success and that uh, conviction of this is a worthy thing. How do, we, how do we engender the sense that this is a worthy thing and we should keep doing it? Uh, so as, as we continue this work, uh, if you have any shyness about contributing to this oral history um, and to this project, uh, Maybe I can appeal to your sense of the greater good. Uh, we are, after all, healthcare people, right? So. Great. We. Go ahead. Um, we have some questions. You, Chris, do you want to? Uh, I can run the. Sure. Yeah. You'd be the mic runner. Thanks, Rick. Well, this far, um, you know, the, the healthcare community has been a measure of how ill you are. But we, what we were missing is a, a goodness measure, how, how well we are. And seeing if we can build a, a, a scale of wellness, perhaps, is a, is a more positive aspect of, of this kind of a model. So um, I'd like to put that to the panel. Yeah, I uh, Jonas Salk, um, who was kind of uh, a visionary far beyond his uh, polio vaccine work, uh, had, had the term, well, we need to create an epidemic of health. And the, the viral qualities of health spreading through a, a culture as opposed to the viral qualities of a flu epidemic or whatever. And um, James Fowler at UCSD has uh, written a book called Connected, and he's actually studying these things. Uh, he studied the flow of happiness in a uh, social network and found that it is indeed viral and contagious and if you're around happy people, happy people tend to create happy people who are around them yeah. more than depressed people create depressed people around them, probably because depressed people aren't as sociable as happy people. <laughs> but uh, he's found this for uh, other forms of uh, uh, addiction, obesity, depression, uh, I'm not sure the whole, I should probably reread his works. But anyway, um, he's, he's a big fan of the role of social networks and of course Facebook and Twitter is all over the place today and who knows what's going to happen next year. But um, that's an incredible new way of looking at health, of, of looking at the viral qualities of health. Uh, one of his conclusions was is that if you're doing vaccination, for example, rather than vaccinating 80% of the population, you, you vaccinate the, the most uh, well-connected uh, nodes in the network. So you can do a whole lot less vaccinations strategically done, and the people who are most viral in their connections would be the ones that um, uh, can have the greatest effect on the network. It works the other way, too, that if you're looking at a social network and you're trying to get a, a community to, to become more educated or something, find the more connected members of the community and, and work with them, say, and, and use that viral uh, spreading notion. So understanding um, health in terms of the network effect and the herd effect and the, the epidemiological spread of things in the positive as well as the negative, um, I, I think is a hugely valuable thing. Now, that doesn't necessarily generate a lot of money and, and transactional value. And if everybody started becoming uh, less depressed by taking walks with their loved ones every day, <laughs> uh, yeah, and well, there's no drugs being sold, there's no visits being generated, but people are more connected with their loved ones and their communities and they're healthier and they have less arthritis. Who knows what the benefits of walking a lot would be? Well, I think we know that pretty well. but. Um, but so having a mechanism for 
expressing that and motivating that and, and, and virally infecting the, the population with that, I think is uh, really powerful. So. There's a, a quote, and I don't know where it comes from. I just know that I have a friend who has it tattooed on his body. And it says, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And that is so important, uh, or important uh, driver for making sure we have the right words. And I remember as a, as a young person being taught the very important difference between saying, I'm not stupid, I'm not stupid, I'm not stupid, I'm not stupid, and turning that into, I'm smart. I'm smart, I'm <laughs> yes, smart, yes, I'm yes. smart. Uh, I think this is important. It's like, don't think of pink elephants, and you know, <laughs> how many pink elephants are we not supposed to be thinking about right now? <laughs> and uh, ICD-10 right. gives us 15,000 of those, but. Yeah. <laughs> Roger, were you asking? No. I so, uh, Andrew Weil, anyone read the books of Andrew Weil? Uh, I'm gonna mention two of them for different reasons. Um, the first one I'd like to mention is Spontaneous Healing which is a book entirely about why it is that there is no course in healing in medical school. Uh, we study the immune system, how to fight off invaders. Uh, we study surgery, we study any number of things, but there's, at least when Andrew Weil went to school, there was no class in how does the body heal itself? How does healing work on its own? Um, and one of the arguments he makes in that book is uh, the result is a focus on what goes wrong and uh, sort of a, a vacuum when it comes to understanding what goes right. Uh, with the result that, for example, he, he cites numerous well-documented instances in which uh, somebody did something they weren't supposed to that was out of the norm, and rather than studying them, they were called an anomaly, and their case was put on a shelf carefully to not be studied because it didn't fit the modality. The example he gives is of a woman whose intestines were riddled with cancer. Uh, she had ulcers all up and down her, can uh, her, her intestines. And uh, all the doctors she went to said, you know, you're going to be dead in a year, maybe five months. There's just, there's, no, there's nothing to, it, it's too advanced, there's nothing to be done. Everybody who gets this far dies. And uh, she gave up, said, well, if I'm going to die anyway, I'm going to do all the things I ever wanted to do. Mm -hmm. She quit her job, and she, she moved into the country, and she went for hikes, and she changed her diet. She told us not to get better because she gave up and decided to be happy. And a year later, when she hadn't died, uh, she went back to the doctors to find out wh what went wrong. They went in to look at the ulcers and they were all gone. And, um, you know, something occurred. Not something magical or mysterious in, the, in a supernatural sense, but, you know, from a healing sense, something important and profound happened, but no one would look at her case because it was an anomaly. So that's not supposed to happen. We don't have a way to talk about health and healing. Uh, none of us studied it, and that's not on the recipe. So. What happens is, although there is a large population of anomalies who, if grouped together, could be studied to understand health and healing, we nevertheless separate them into individuals and put them on separate shelves in separate doctor's offices, carefully not looking at the pattern because it's not about illness. Uh, the other book I wanted to mention is the bestseller, Eight Weeks to Optimum Health. Uh, not because I think everybody should go out and read it, I'm a big Andrew Weil fan, but rather because um, he's taking a stab at uh, what do patterns of health look like? You know, whatever, whatever's making you sick, whatever your problems, what are some healthy things you probably ought to be doing in your life? And an example he puts in there, you should probably go for a walk outside every day. Uh, you know, numbers seem to suggest that when people go for a walk outside more or less every day, they tend to be healthier than when they don't, regardless of how they felt when they began walking. And uh, the book is packed with things like that. And uh, one of the ones late in the book, which I thought of when I first saw you talking about beautiful health care. It's got a whole chapter on beauty and what you can do to improve the amount of beauty in your life because people who are surrounded by beautiful things and experiences, regardless of their state of health, tend to get better for reasons we don't entirely understand. Well, this is an example of, of the issues. Is If you do create something that prevents problems from happening um, and people do it, um, how do you understand that you did it? Um, yeah. So, um, and what are we already doing that are preventing problems? Uh, so we have no way of understanding the, the, the value of prevention uh, other than failing to prevent it. 
and we have no language to talk about this. So this is where the pattern language would come in to. And probably we're talking about encoding things that are pretty commonsensical. Uh, taking a walk might be uh, a real strong pattern in all of this. But it's done from the perspective of, of, of health. The other issue is the placebo effect in your self-image and um, the, the incredible power of that. I mean, it's called the placebo effect, but it, um, there, and then there's the nocebo effect, which is the negative consequences of anticipation. So uh, they did a study with aspirin and, and uh, chest pain, and uh, they gave the, the, the clinical study. Uh, the one side was given the instructions on the aspirin bottle. They read them the label of all the possible side effects of aspirin. <clears throat> and the other one, they just said, take these aspirins. And so both groups said, well, if you have chest pain, take the aspirin. If you have any side effects, stop right away and you know, come back. So guess what? The people that had the label read to them uh, had a 600% increase in uh, side effects. <laughs> yes, yes, so that's yes. the <laughs> negative side of it. So, <clears throat> so there's so much power in all of this and so much novelty. Uh, and then the, the internet has, is here, and if somebody, you know, buries a potato at midnight and cures their cancer, and it gets out on the internet, and 47 retweets and 19 blogs, and suddenly you Google cancer cure, and everybody's talking about burying a potato at midnight. Well, it actually might do something for you. I mean, <laughs> just the exercise of getting around burying potatoes. It's might... onions, actually. Onion. <laughs> Thanks for clearing that up. <laughs> and what about tortoises or turtles? Uh, it's all, turtles all the way down. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, um, it, it's obviously a very, very deep subject, but I think that opening up the discussion in a formal way of patternizing this, building a language, building this concise a linguistic abstraction, and using that as a driver for our next generation of IT. And when we start talking about social networks, everybody says, well, we have to Twitter. You know, well, okay. But what are, what, there's a broader notion of how we connect ourselves through networks and the notion of a smart center versus smart edges. And there's a whole level of dialogue and understanding that needs to be brought into this that I think a pattern language can pull us into. Did you want to? Yeah. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a formally trained computer scientist and I love math and numbers and discrete structures and all that stuff as much as the next computer scientist. Um, but I also am a human being and I, I appreciate the value of my grandmother's medicine and the stories that I hear from my friends and, and the importance of that dialogue. And, um, and what I think what we're talking about here is the opportunity to find that place where these two things go together. Uh, there are always, we, we are a, a, a peoples of the scientific method. Uh, we're going to keep charts and graphs and things and uh, that's just part of what we do, how we've been socialized to solve problems. And at the same time, when I tell my doctor, no, I actually really think the root canal is causing my back problems. I want my doctor to believe that I really think my root canal is causing my back problems, even though there may be no evidence to that fact. Um, I am looking forward to the formal part of discovering these patterns, because I think it will enable us to communicate to folks who don't want to hear the story. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, and, and this is, gets back into the abstraction, you know, some people believe crystals will cure your health, and okay. <laughs> um, maybe they do, maybe, maybe it's as good as bearing a potato, you know, I don't know. But anyway, the, how do you deal with the, the kind of the one-off belief system and the clinical trial uh, validation of it? when something is so personalized to the belief system of the individual going through the, the process. So if you really believe that crystals are going to cure your allergies, um, there's a good chance that they're going to do it. And uh, you know, you can talk about what kind of crystals are going to cure it. Uh, placebo effect is more effective when the doctor hurts you doing the placebo. So a shot is more effective than a sugar pill. Um, and so there's, there's so much in there, but that has to be addressed. That's part of the pattern language right. is yeah. 
what is the self-efficacy, self-patience? Yeah. Uh, I, by the way, never said the placebo effect wasn't real. I think it is real, and it, it, it's, that's one of the problems, is that it's so real. I, I know one company that had a drug that they did the clinical trials on, it was very, very effective, but it turns out the placebo effect was abnormally effective also, so they couldn't get it licensed. So why don't we just sell the placebo effect? Um, <laughs> but uh, that's one part of it, and I think a, a Western-trained uh, physician would pipe in and saying one case is not data. Uh, it's, it's one anecdote does not make data. Um, and they'd want to see a clinical trial for that. The next question is when you have something that's so personalized and so infused with the, the person's expectations and predisposition for whatever the treatment is, it does become very personalized. You confound that with what we're learning with genomics and you know, your genomic uh, sequencing influences all this, but it's not a direct causal relationship. So suddenly we have an indicator that you have a uh, predilection towards aggressive prostate cancer versus not aggressive. Uh, so that might change your, your treatment course or whatever. So it becomes ever more fuzzy, ever more associative, uh, I'll call it, rather than integrated. And um, but we have to deal with it. I mean, that's, that's the essence of what's going on here. Um, and how do we talk about these patterns rather than saying, oh, that's crazy complementary versus real Western or whatever. Uh, and so building a language to allow us to talk about that, I think, is, is critical. And once we get that language, we can start talking about a new model of, of looking at associations rather than uh, direct clinical um, uh, isolation of facts into testable hypotheses. Anyway, it's, it's a big area. We, we have to deal with it. I mean, it's, it's, it's happening, um, and um, 
I think that patterns is one way of, of getting to it. And I think that when we do get this pattern language, we can start talking about supporting it through an IT infrastructure and get back to the idea of IT being uh, the leader of the train rather than the caboose. Uh, yes, David. Part of when you, when you talk about traditional views about language, one of the things that you talk about is characterizing particular words. When you say this particular word is a noun, or this particular word is acting like an adjective, or this particular word uh, has characteristics that we associate with adverbs, those actually are just ways of describing particular words. And part of what you're talking about when you're talking about pattern language is you're talking about characterizing these modes of behavior ways of looking at the world, the languages um, that people are using by their actions as much as by the words that they're using. Do you see that, uh, am I following the right path here? I mean, the part of your, your patterns or categories and ways of uh, seeing things in commonalities that may not necessarily be common unless you look at it just the right way? Well, it's, it's a big question. Um, I guess I liken it to uh, being an ancient Greek that knew the Roman numerals and somebody's trying to convince you to you think of zero and the decimal numbers and that if you did that you could talk algebra and calculus and you're used to enumerating your sheep and how can you talk algebra to someone who's a sheep enumerator and that level of, of I kind of myself well, there goes the yeah <laughs> <laughs> So I don't know what's going to come out of this. I mean, I, 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 really, I call that a missing nothing. The zero was a missing nothing to the Greeks. Mm -hmm. that they, they couldn't see it. They couldn't see the value for it. And you can't uh, appreciate the value for it until you appreciate the value of algebra or calculus, which maybe you need to have demonstrated in the, someone else sending a rocket to the moon or something like that. You don't need to be a calculus expert to benefit from the calculus. So being able to pull yourself up a level of abstraction, by definition, you don't know what, what you're going to be able to say in that new, new level. And we, we might have an entirely different uh, word for, for time and flow, for example. The Hopis have a different time orientation. So our current uh, vision of time is very snapshot oriented as opposed to flow oriented. So maybe there's new perceptions, I call it diachronic. You know, the other term I'm throwing out here, I call it beninosis. It's a way of understanding by what's positive and, and good and virtuous or whatever, as opposed to malnosis, which is a way of understanding by what's broken and failing. So we have a malnostic healthcare system. We don't have a, a beninostic healthcare system. And once you learn the beninostic view, you can still do the malnostic view, but you can't get to the beninostic view from the malnostic view. I think we need to disappear disappear here. We've got a card Actually, leaving it. Um, we have another half hour. We're coming to 12.30 is the session. Oh, and do, no. Oh, do, oh, I thought oh, we, we were leaving at be. noon. I'm sorry, I mean, both things are going to be driving. Oh, you guys are leaving at noon. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, well, that was certainly oh, well, good. Gee. <laughs> <laughs> well, then that's all she wrote. <laughs> Thank you very much for your, uh, for your time and your presentation. Thank you. You guys could keep talking. Uh, well, and, and I have a question. How do how can how can they help us more? How can we start talking more about this? Have you created a place where we'll be having the dialogue? Yes, I have a theory, and the theory arose actually while I was listening to Tom for like the fourth or fifth time during this conference uh, discuss books and list books and authors. And I kept thinking I should read every damn one of those books, and I'm not going to remember a single one of them afterwards, and except. If the recording, if the recording